so good noon, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Della Rucker. I am the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop and also communication manager for the American Independent Business Alliance. And this, is, this conversation today is part of our series, uh, Wise Economy series, Accelerate Us, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Local Economy Revolution. And I'm delighted today to get a chance to sit down with a person who's a new friend of mine that I've been just like loving the chance to work with over the last few weeks. And she just, she just rock socks. There's just no other, no other decent way to put that. So Theodora Skiatis, did I say that right this time? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Della. I got one right. Yay, B. <laughs> so Theodora is the executive director of Cambridge Local First, which is an independent business alliance in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You might know that name. That's where Harvard is, along with a lot of other important places. And um, for those of us of a certain age, it is the homeland of Car Talk, um, which was a very popular show on National Public Radio. That got a smile out of her. I like that. Um, hasn't been on for, I think it's in reruns still. But, uh, you know, the, us Midwesterners always heard car talk from Cam Cambridge Square. And we just went, oh, this is like a whole other world. <laughs> At any rate, so, so Theodora has been in this position for about a year. I should also explain that an American independent, an independent business alliance rather, is for the for those of you who know Main Street programs, downtown revitalization programs, economic development, things like that. It's 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 got similarities. The biggest difference is that they focus on independent businesses, which means um, locally owned businesses that are generally not part of a franchise. And they work generally across a whole community. Some are focused on downtowns, some are focused on whole cities, some are focused on multi-county regions. So they run the gamut um, and they're very, very network based. So they're very focused on providing um, services and advocacy and education, especially around these quest this question of how do we foster a resilient local economy and coming to that by saying those independent, locally owned businesses, often small businesses, that's really the central piece of the puzzle. And if we've seen anything over the course of this pandemic, other than how lousy a lot of us were at washing our hands for it, um, we've really come to understand just how crucial those kind of small businesses are. So I'm delighted to have you here today, Theo. Thanks. Why don't you, is it okay if I call you Theo on the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's when I, so I said Theodora, I'm used to calling her Theo. So I think, I think that's a little more comfortable. Um, so Theo, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Cambridge Local First, because you, you went to school at Harvard um, and you've had, you know, a lot of experience doing some other really fascinating stuff involving languages that I didn't know of before. And, but, but you've chosen to kind of focus at least a good portion of your considerable energy on Cambridge Local First. So why don't you paint us a little bit of the picture of how that developed? Absolutely. So um, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And what happened was in 20. 17, I helped start the Harvard Square Neighborhood Association because our neighborhood didn't have an association. Oh. A few years, yeah. Um, and I met some wonderful people through that process. And a few years later, one of the women that I had uh, collaborated with to help start the Neighborhood Association, uh, who also, uh, she's a woman who wears many hats. One of those is board chair of Cambridge Local First reached out to me and asked if I would consider being the executive director on an interim basis um, for a 30-day contract. And the reason was the previous ED had stepped down to run for Cambridge City Council. So there was a moment of um, vacancy in the leadership of the organization, but it was more than that. It was also an existential moment because 
as has happened with many local forest organizations, the finances, uh, programming, and membership uh, of the organization had been on the decline. And so there was a question about whether or not the organization should continue. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really difficult moment. Uh, I came in on a 30-day contract to see if the organization should be paused or, or continued. And through a series of conversations that I had with board members, we decided to give it a shot. And so I stayed on for a series of month-long contracts. Uh, during that time, we focused on revitalizing the board, redoing the website, which uh, really needed um, a facelift, and revitalizing membership. And then once we stabilized some of those core requirements, we started focusing on finances and programming and, and a whole host of other things. So it was, a, it was an intense um, initiation into the ecosystem yeah. of local economies, but it was a lot of fun. And um, it's been now just over a year and a few months, and and it's it's a totally different world. That's fabulous. So I didn't. This this was not one of the things we we're going to be talking about, yeah. but um, I'm always fascinated by that question of how organizations kind of get themselves out of a hole, because I've been part of organizations that have done that. Sometimes I think. I don't know how much we did the right thing and how much we just got lucky. And I've been part of organizations or been a close observer of organizations that, you know, can't make it. So, so you ha what happened when you, so it sounds like the first thing you did was really going to the existing board members and what was that conversation like? Yeah. So we were fortunate in that some of the board members were the original founders. There hmm. were four original founders. Uh, of whom one is Lori Hamill, mm -hmm. and who you know well. For, for for the sake of everybody else, Lori yeah. is one of the founders of um, Bally, um, Be a Localist, which now has a different name, which I think is Common Ground, um, as well as the American Independent Alliance, as well as the Sustainable Business, Business Network, Network of, of Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. And I didn't know he was in Cambridge first, but of course. So yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, and he's a neighbor too. He lives across the street. So <laughs> it's a small world. Um, so yeah, so he's now on our advisory board. But at the time when I when I came in a year ago, a year and a few months, um, he wasn't on, involved at all. So three of the four founding members were still on the board. And it, we were very fortunate in that they and the others um, were pretty committed to the organization's survival. So we had a board of, of business owners who were incredibly committed to the mission of the organization and who really wanted to see the organization succeed and who were willing to help put in the work to make that happen. So, wow. yeah, and we are we are very fortunate in many ways. We are well resourced as a community and we have a lot of really incredible, hardworking and committed residents in Cambridge. So so that was part of it. I think. I realized that there were various interpersonal dynamics that had to be resolved. And so I worked to resolve those. Um, mm -hmm. And once they were resolved, we were able to continue in a much more harmonious fashion. Um, and there was another issue, which was the organization is celebrating its 15th year this summer. Um, mm -hmm. A year ago, no, rather three years ago, the organization's so for 12 years, they had been doing a member directory mm -hmm. and they stopped offering the member directory between two and a half and three years ago. And it really put the organization into question uh, because it had been their primary member offering. And so they had a hard time transitioning from this physical offering to a, a consistent and clear member value proposition that could um, could in excite members about renewing their membership and yeah. local banks about renewing their sponsorship, which are the two primary sources of revenue for the organization. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we clarified the member proposition um, and we completed the process of, of transforming our services into online services almost exclusively. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have in-person events as well, but so much of the work that we do is via the computer. And we've been able to clarify our value proposition to make sure that members understand what we're offering. Now, wait. So when you said that you are you you moved mostly everything to quote unquote the computer, mm -hmm. um, as, that's fascinating in part because you know Cambridge is not a big place. 
I mean, I know that if you have to walk from one end to the other, it feels like a long way. But an hour. um, Pardon? One hour. Not it even. takes an hour to walk across it? It's like two and a half miles. <laughs> yeah, okay. three. So, so by a lot of people's standards, and frankly, by a lot of IBA standards, that's a very compact area. Yeah. Um, when you said that most things have moved to the computer, was that the case before the pandemic hit? Yes. Really? Yeah. I mean, we have a three-pronged value proposition. We do member services. We do education and we do advocacy. Mm. So the member services were the most in person. Um, We would have trainings that were in person, um, gatherings that were in person, but a lot of it was done on the computer. Uh, Providing Mm. services to businesses can be done over the phone and virtually in different capacities. Mm -hmm. Education was done almost entirely over the computer. So we have a very large social media uh, presence in Cambridge and we do a huge amount of education about why folks should shop locally. And that's mostly virtual. We do have some in-person edu- mm-hmm. or we had some in-person education um, campaigns, but most of it was virtual. And then the mm-hmm. advocacy too, uh, it's done through email advocacy. So a lot what? of it was already virtual, yeah. Wow, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so and, I, and we'll go back to, the technology things that we were planning to talk sure. about in a second, but the, you know, when, when something cool, co- when you like discover something cool like this, how can you not just kind of like pursue it a little bit? And even with so much as I've been, been, you know, talking with you and hearing you and learning about you and Cambridge local first lately that, you know, this, some of this is new to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so lay out for us what the value proposition to a small business owner is. And I'm thinking at this point, you know, a bookstore or a, you know, I had, well, I had like the best cannoli in my life in, in, um, in Cambridge. So, you know, I'm all in favor. I can't remember the name of it, but the cannoli place is like to die for. Um, so, so what's the value proposition to, to those, to those kind of businesses? Yeah. So, Again, it's a it's a three prong value proposition. So, in terms of member services, and I can actually uh, share my screen just to show a few of the things that we've been providing, if that's helpful. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. She wasn't planning on sharing the screen on this one, I don't think. But no, uh, but I I can share it. Um, okay. Theo seems to have uh, high capability for doing stuff on the fly. So, yeah. So. Uh, again, it's a three-prong value proposition, and you can see the full mm. proposition here. Mm, okay. Can you guys see it? Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, so, is it possible for us to get, um, for, for you to send me a link to that so that I can uh, post it to the blog post with this interview? Yeah, um, and we even have a, a more nicely designed version, but it would take me a few minutes to find my emails. Um, no, whichever so you prefer. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll send, I'll send you both. Um, so, so yeah, so basically we have a, what we've been detailing to our members is a, is a three pronged value proposition. Um, so one of them is, uh, small business assistance, which in part details or involves marketing opportunities and support for business growth. So we have at this point, almost 20,000 followers on social media. This is a little bit outdated, which means we have one of the largest audiences in the city. And, um, yeah, and, and it's been a great way to do a lot of advocacy for small businesses on social media. So, for example, here we go. Um, on Twitter, we're able to do a huge amplification of businesses. Um, uh, uh, you know, the things that they're selling, what they're what they're offering for for the community. Um, mm-hmm. And just highlighting their, their narratives in general. Uh, oh, so cool. we have, yeah, pretty active uh, Twitter as well as Facebook account. Um, I find that Facebook has the greatest traction. We might get 2,000 views on Facebook, whereas on Twitter, it's harder to track and we won't get as quite as many comments um, or as much engagement. So Facebook is our most active of them. And then we also have a uh, an Instagram account. Oh, cool. So, yeah. And so anyway, the first is, oopsie. The first is um, 
small business support, which, which as you can see, a lot of it has been done virtually. Um, yeah. But we also offer a lot of technical assistance on trainings, uh, things including grants and loans, employment law, regulation, revenue generation, rent negotiation, and others. I mean, these are all different activities highlighting the kinds of business support that we provide. Education is a little bit, it's, it's not that the business necessarily feels the benefit directly, but when you, uh, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. And so as we're informing consumers about why they should shop locally, and, and the options that they have to choose from, it benefits small businesses. Um, mm. it, it might be harder to directly translate a piece of education to their impact, but it, it helps all the businesses. And then yeah. advocacy is the same, it, a rising tide lifts all boats. So the, the advocacy work that we do doesn't necessarily benefit one business directly, but it benefits them all together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes total sense. Um, and I, and the fact that you're using your, um, your technology, your, um, especially the Facebook and the Twitter to amplify their message to, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to have that amplification in conjunction with educational information for the public and in combination with advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It totally makes sense that you're, you're, you're doing so much of this virtually. Yeah. You know, we 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 live in that manner these days and that's really ex i mean I, i'm impressed that you've got that much that much reach and that much impact thank you and you and i will have to talk offline about um leveraging instagram into this because sure. that's something that i'm trying to figure out on the amoeba side right now it's just it's, yeah. it's enough of a different thing and i'm a word human so it doesn't help me it's um, a challenge yeah. All right. Well, cool. That will be that will be uh, a good thing to talk about in the future. Um, so when the pandemic hit you guys initially and you're yeah. in the Northeast, you're in Massachusetts. So you were relatively early impacted by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How did that change the way you were operating the experience? I mean, I think it's obvious mm -hmm. what the experience of your your independent business owners probably looked like. Um, yeah. How did that how did that change the work that you needed to do as part of Cambridge Local First? Yeah, it changed it in so many ways. Um, it increased it first. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, my workload I would say initially tripled or quadrupled for a period of a month. Yeah. Yes, I know. Well, I, I also have been working. <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, oh it hasn't. It, yeah, it has. It has gone down a little bit in the in the recent weeks, which is nice. But um, I was doing a lot of work. So th the first thing that we did was to level set. Um, we had a community conversation the very first week. Um, so this would have been, I think, the third week in March. And we had about 70 businesses attend and we just had them talk about what was on their minds and they were scared and concerned and frustrated and confused and and were very uh eager to share their their feelings and so we just had a two-hour conversation with 70 businesses in cambridge which i hadn't i hadn't had the opportunity to do in the month prior. i mean it was it was a really incredible moment to see so many businesses come together and and share their concerns with each other. There was a real sense of vulnerability that um, was shared among everybody who participated. And, and what we, we did was we just jumped into action. So we started providing um, a huge number of services based on what folks needed and it changed over time. So initially, um, there, as the conversation on grants and loans emerged, we started helping our businesses apply to, to grants and loans because we wanted to make sure that they were able to access the funds that they needed to stay in business. What are you um, helping them in mm -hmm. that? A number of, of, of things. So for example, we had, I think a few successive community conversations that focused specifically on the grant and loan applications. This would have been late March and early April as they were in full flux. Um, and uh, Lori Hamill was on a bunch of those calls because he's a business owner as well. He was yes. able to answer a huge number of questions about the very intricacies of the applications because he was undergoing them too. 
We also yeah. had city representatives on the phone who were able to answer questions. And there was a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning because folks had questions that really only other business owners could answer because wow. of, of the shared experience. I, I'm, I'm a resource for them, but I haven't done a PPP application myself. So yes. I, I'm familiar with much of, of the complexity of the application, but, but I haven't actually sat down and mm -hmm. filled out the form. And so when folks were question, had questions about this particular element of the application, the people who were best positioned to help them were other business owners. And so we facilitated spaces where business owners could come together and answer each other's questions. And, and spaces in this case is like a Zoom call. A Zoom call, virtual spaces, yeah. Um, yeah, I know, spaces. But it, <laughs> but it really feels very intimate. I mean, they're really nice mm -hmm. conversations and, and um, at this point, I think there's a really good rapport that's built up among the, among the businesses who've been attending, and they feel very comfortable around each other and very comfortable asking questions that you know indicate a lack of awareness or or knowledge on a particular subject. And sometimes that can be hard to do. So, and yeah, that that to me is so amazing because you know for 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 people like like me who've worked with organizations involving entrepreneurs, small business owners, et cetera, you know, all over the years, yeah. the, the stereotype is I'm a cowboy, I'm gonna do my own thing, what goes on within my walls is none of my business, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And yet what you found is even without the ability to like stereotypically, you know, interact with your neighbor next door, mm -hmm you found that this group was peer learning and kind of building community oh, in the sure. virtual context. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's so not what anybody thought would happen. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I also found that in previous months, businesses were so busy, um, their schedules were packed and it was very hard to schedule a, a single meeting with them. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've had 10 successive community conversations and we've had um, anywhere from 30 to 70 folks attending each of them. Um, wow. Yeah, maybe the fewest was 25. Yeah, we've had really good attendance and really dynamic conversations. Yeah. In the more recent community conversations, we've had folks talk about, uh, we've had other themes. We've started talking about reopening. So for mm -hmm. example, we had one yesterday. And um, so we had a group from Harvard College do research for us for five weeks. They presented the, their research. And it was an interactive presentation. So folks were able to ask questions and um, and get their questions answered. And uh, then we transitioned to a, a 30 minute conversation on reopening. And, and mm -hmm. you know, again, you could see that folks were concerned. I mean, they were frustrated and there's so much guidance on how to reopen. And there are state po level policies and city level policies, and they're not always the same. Which do you prioritize? There are different phases of reopening and it's not always yeah. clear like retail is implicitly included perhaps in phase one but it's not explicitly described oh, and man. that was something that came up yesterday so for our retail businesses at which stage do they open it's not always explicitly laid out um and so those are the kinds of questions that we grappled with yesterday so the the theme of the conversation has changed over time but um sort of the the openness of the of the space has has um, persisted, and and I can show you the notes. It's a pretty dynamic. Well, um, I, mm -hmm. I did want to get a little bit into because I knew we were sure. going to talk about these town hall meetings because they have been incredible, and I've actually been lucky enough to be able to sit in on a couple of them. That which, was really nice. Yeah, you know, like like we're we're awesome for the number of participants, the quality of the participation. And I don't just mean that, you know, like people were doing whatever, um, exactly. but just, just really, really engaged. I would love you to show me the notes, but first I want to talk through just real quickly, kind of technically how you lay this out. And yeah. you you talked about this on a an event called the Leaders of Local Roundtable for Amoeba, the American Independent Business Alliance, the other day. Um, and I'll, I'll take the notes from that and put it in here as well. But so these are a Zoom call. They're announced via your newsletter. Yep. And then people register, I assume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, actually, they don't. So, oh. yeah. So, so here's how it goes. Basically, mm -hmm. we, um, we publicize the community. And, and at, this folks, uh, at this point, folks generally have a sense of the, co the conversations. They're the same time. 
4 30 every thursday mm -hmm. but for the first four or five we experimented with different times the first one was okay. at 7 30 p.m i think the next one was at maybe five and then two and then eventually we settled on 4 30 because it's it's later into the day meetings are generally gone but it's pre-dinner and it's not yeah. so late into the evening you know it doesn't take people away from their families so it's a it's a pretty good time to have these conversations okay, um cool. and so yeah so basically what we do is and i can share my screen here too is we we um highlight them over our newsletter and here's an example so this is an example of a newsletter and we're highlighting the community conversation here's another one and here's here's a third example um where there's more specific information so for for example this was a conversation intended to build camaraderie between independent business alliances and Cambridge and to show that our members are not alone in their struggle. So we mm -hmm. had folks from Louisville, DC, and Austin attend, as well as um, Somerville, our neighbor. And um, so we highlight, highlight the conversation over our newsletter, which goes to the community because these are open conversations. Anyone can join, not just business owners. Mm -hmm. I highlight them over emails to our members, and I also highlight them over social media. So here, mm -hmm. here's an example of the marketing for yesterday's. And here's an example over Twitter. And here's an example over Instagram. And actually, I don't require logins. Everything is open, including, including the meeting notes. So okay. um, yeah, so anybody can just find the Zoom information. It's right here. We've had no issues. Uh, theoretically, there could be an issue. Um, but because I'm so busy and I'm balancing so many different things, it's easiest for me not to, to do registration and just to share it with everybody. Um, so cool. that's what I do. Well, and that also makes it more inclusive. Yeah, that's so, right. It's easier to access for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the risk is that somebody takes advantage of that, but you know, yeah. sometimes we just knock on wood. Okay. Um, when, so, so these are conversations that people are having sometimes they're having it with a presenter sometimes they're talking to each other sometimes they're doing both so two questions well a question and then uh lead into the next thing you're going to show us um i have this picture in my head of the the skit that came out from snl recently where they had the church meeting via zoom and nobody could mute and there's all this chaos going on and then and then everybody was on, you know, it was just like, I'm, I'm also dealing with I this. For, for, I haven't seen it. Yet. Oh, you haven't? I'll have to no. say it. It is, it is hysterical. It's and so funny. I know. And I hadn't watched SNL for years. And then somebody sent this to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is so, so perfect. perfect. Um, but, um, and I'll post the link to this yeah. thing as well. Oh, so great. But um, when it comes to, yeah. you know, it, so, so there's like, you have to learn how to do Zoom right. A little bit, yeah. Um, so did you have trouble with that at first where people were like talking over each other and somebody didn't mute and, you know, you could hear the vacuum cleaner going in the background and, you know, all that um, kind of stuff? I'm just an assertive muter. Uh, so <laughs> I guess it's what it is. I mean, if when people are coming in, so, so what I generally do is I open the line 10 or 15 minutes early and there are always people who are already dialed in when I've opened the line and who want to chat. I mean, yesterday I opened it 10 minutes early and I think there were two people already on the phone. So uh -huh. yeah, and so basically I allow for pre-conversation um, uh -huh. so that folks who just wanted to chat a little bit have the opportunity to do so. And then I wait two or three minutes, but I, I do try to be prompt because if you set the expectation that there are delays and, and that things are not according to schedule, then I think people expect it and, and it doesn't, I think set the right expectations. So I try to be pretty prompt, but about two or three minutes in, I say, okay, we're getting started. And I always lay the, the ground rules. So I say, I'm muting everybody. Everyone's muted. Uh, I say, you can uh, unmute yourself as you wish, but please recognize that if there's background noise, it's better for you to be muted. I remind people that if we encourage them to use their video, it's so nice to see faces. However, um, if they have to go use the bathroom or pick their nose or whatever, we encourage them to turn off their videos so that not everybody sees. Um, you know, crazy things have happened, not on our community conversations, but I've heard. Um, I remind people that they can use the chat and that they should. They can raise their hands if they have a hard time 
um, getting their voices heard. They can unmute if they have questions at any point. So it's always interactive and folks can jump in at any point. Cool. And um, yeah, so I, I lay some ground rules and then we get started. And so everyone's muted, but they can unmute if they want. We've had a few instances where people, can't, especially if they're on the phone, they couldn't figure out star six and they couldn't unmute. But I think it's, you know, not everybody's able to maneuver the technology perfectly, but it's easier than having everyone speak at the same time. So it's actually been fun. It hasn't been an well, issue. Well, and, and I think that's a great little moment of sort of Zoom one-on-one -on -one for, for folks. Um, I think those are extraordinarily good ground rules. And especially when it comes to um, aggressive muting, as you put it, but also making sure people have lots of, of alternatives for how to engage. Yes. And this, I'm, I'm going to try not to go down this rabbit hole, but one of my, one of, one of the advantages that I see in this environment mm -hmm. is that for people, who, people, you know, you and I are the exception in that we're not afraid to talk to people, mm -hmm, that's right. not afraid to, to speak publicly or whatever. Sure. Um, but a lot of people aren't. And that's true. The thing that's really cool to me, one of the things that's been cool to me about um, watching people learn to navigate in this environment yeah. is that people, I think in, in a lot of ways, they, they these technologies give people a way to find their voice and yeah. express themselves. Whereas if we were in a room with 50 people and a microphone in the middle of it, you know, that might be just too, too intimidating to do. I agree. I think it democratizes participation. I like that. I like that. So, but it's not just yabber, 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 yabber. As you pointed out, you are actually taking what you're hearing and not only acting on it mm -hmm. as an organization, but you're making a record for everybody. So can you show the document you were going to show? Before yeah. I went down the hole? The community conversation notes? Yes. Sure. Because this is, this is impressive. Thank you. So these are the notes. And um, what helps, I think, is that I structure an agenda every time. And it's generally a loose agenda. So all that we had on the agenda was this presentation, highlighting grants, highlighting reopening plans, and um, a few other updates. And so what we do is I make it editable. So anybody can edit as we're going. And honestly, for the first maybe eight weeks, it was editable 24 seven. In the last two weeks, because it's become a 48 page reference, I've made it view only, except during the community conversation when anyone can make edits. And- Because um, at 48 pages, you can't really like keep track of everything that's-, that's Yeah. 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 And I think I would, I, and I do back it up once in a while. I'll download it um, just in case anything happens. But I wouldn't want someone to make a mistake um, with so much information here. So, yeah. so yeah. So, for example, at yesterday's conversation, this group did a presentation, which was really interesting. They had done three different projects, um, data related studies and visualizations, and they presented that. Um, and so I gave them control of the screen. Three different people shared their screen and they all took questions during the presentation. Awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And then we talked about grants. So we had a representative from the city, Pardis, um, share some grant updates with us. And folks had a bunch of questions for her. She answered the questions. And then we talked about updates. And uh, folks had a lot of questions here. And then we did some other updates. So the Small Business, Advi Small Business Advisory Committee was presented. Um, we had a member, Sarah, from Cleanland talk about a petition that um, a bike safety group is organizing to create more avenues for mobility in the city so that folks have uh, non-car related, you know, more easy non-car related forms of transportation accessible to them, as well as some other programs. So folks from Scout Magazines and Culture House um, had their presentations or offerings shared um, and some others. And then what I do is I track attendees because mm -hmm. Uh, and I list all emails so that folks can reach out directly to anybody that they want to connect with. Um, yeah. And then, so for example, I'll just show you one other. This was last week. We mm -hmm. talked about uh, space spaces, like how to reimagine public spaces. So mm -hmm. Andrew Howard from the Better Block came and talked oh, yeah. about, yeah, it was really cool. A great conversation on public space. And again, updates and then attendees. 
that's cool. Yeah. So it's a huge document because it's a big it's document. literally um, extensive notes from all of these meetings for the last two months. Yep. And anyone who missed it can go through and really get a very detailed um, understanding of what was happened. So yeah. you've got, are you typing frantically the whole way through this? You said it was open access. I am. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, um, I am typing, but a lot of it I do in advance. So for example, the grant information, the, the background information, I just copy and pasted that in from an email I'd already sent to members. So I, I'm only taking notes. Um, all of the substantive content I put into the agenda in advance. So almost everything you just saw was already in the agenda when mm -hmm. the meeting started. What mm -hmm. I do is I take notes um, on feedback, questions, uh, additions, but anything that I had already planned for the agenda is is already there. How much viewership, I mean, it's an, an extraordinary documentation. Yeah, thank you. It is completely awesome. Um, and and just you know the historian me in me is like oh my god I want access to that in fifty years when somebody's writing you know be so history. interesting yeah. yeah um but also you know as a as a business owner who's trying to yeah. figure stuff out provided mm -hmm. that people you know know how to use you know search basic search functions yeah, I can help you, know, you I think there's some things that you can um you can assume in some contexts and other contexts it would be like okay are, are people really going to know how to do this yeah. but um but so what you you know so it's a, it's pretty extraordinary do you have any sense of how frequently or how many people go back and look at that document use it as a resource hmm. i could probably identify how many views there have been okay. um but i don't know like through some sort of analytics yeah i don't no offhand i mean we've had as many as, as 20 people viewing it at the same time especially mm. at the beginning i mean for the first three weeks we had almost continuous viewership anywhere from 10 to 20 people now it's more like three to five at any one time i have no idea who they are it's a mystery yeah because they're all popping up as little anonymous yeah little anonymous i know i, I, I don't know yeah i'm very no, curious no. though I'm, well, if you if you see anonymous dodo or something, that might be me. I don't who knows. I'll um, keep an eye out. <laughs> um, great. So you know, so that's that's a fantastic sort of, um, you know, you we've get gotten a, a really amazing picture just so far of kind of philosophy of how to do this mm -hmm. and some technical chops for how to do this. Um, and in terms of that communication with the, you know, the business owners, yeah. the stakeholders, the, the, the public agencies, the nonprofits, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, you know, that's, that's extraordinary resources, but we also have plenty of folks in and around Cambridge who just want to know where to, um, get a good cannoli. Although I can find that one on the map. I can't. Do you know the name of the place I'm talking about? It's Mike's next Pastry. To, sorry, Mike's Pastry. Yes, which is which is just next to on the side street next to the student union. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I could find that one. Um, but you know, if I'm trying to figure out, you know, what restaurants are open, where can I get carry at? Where, you know, where do I have to order via phone versus walk up? Yeah. Um, can I still get my suit dry clean? Can you know those kind of things? You have an extraordinary resource. So before you show it, yeah, and, I've queued up. Yeah. So so it's it's you'll see it in a second, folks. But when you when you see this thing, there's there's a lot that went in behind it, um, a lot on the, the work of of this organization, in addition to um, partnerships that they were able to develop. So uh, t before we get into the platform, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how, like, like what the backstory is. Yeah, so, okay, so we, um, have a very dynamic board. We actually have, I think, an 18-person board of directors and a 12-person advisory board. 
So we have what is ultimately a 30 person board. Yeah. I mean, the board of directors has greater responsibility, um, for di like judici judiciary responsibility, financial yeah. responsibility for the organization, as well as, thank you, as well as um, greater uh, involvement through committees and sometimes task forces. Mm -hmm. And we have several task forces ongoing. Um, but the advisory board is also very engaged. They serve as, as resources and as guidance. So um, I leverage these board members and advisory board members as much as I can. One of our board members, her name is Rachel Hahn, um, works for an organization called Open Data Source. Mm -hmm. Open, I'm sorry, Open Data Soft. And um, it's a company that's based in Boston at 50 Milk Street, which, it, which is a co-working space. It's it's where the Cambridge Innovation Center has a lot of its public interest themed startups. And so ODS is, is a company that works with city and state governments, I think predominantly or exclusively on data related projects. And they do a lot of data visualizations. And so in the time of COVID, they have transitioned to helping cities. Um, and it first was in Europe. So they were working with cities in Germany, I think definitely France. Uh, and elsewhere to help them visualize different business services for uh, for residents. And in the United States, they're offering six months of free service for nonprofits. I'm not sure if it's also extended to cities, but I do know that for nonprofits, they are making this offer. Um, and so we, we're taking advantage of it. And because Rachel's a board member, as well as an employee of ODS, she has been incredibly helpful in, in one, bringing this opportunity to our attention and, and helping us implement it. Awesome, awesome. Well, why don't you show them the map? Okay, so here we go. All right, can you see this? Okay, yeah, so we're seeing a website. Um, this is the website for Open Data Soft. And again, um, for folks that are end up listening to this, uh, I will yeah. look, look in the web post, the uh, the blog posts for this uh, series, and I'll have the links. Perfect. So, so yeah, so this is this is the initial landing page that highlights the initiatives. This is what we saw first. And so I saw that there were all these ways to visualize data. And it inspired us to replicate it in Cambridge. And you can see that they have undertaken this set of initiatives all around the world, mostly, yeah. I think, Europe and North America. So the first step was okay. generating a huge database of information. Uh, so we started tagging all open local businesses in Cambridge. So there are 547, sorry, 48 open local businesses. And we tag them based on the kind of business from different inputs, um, as well as if they were doing delivery, takeout, online sales, if they are a restaurant selling groceries, there are a few of those. Um, fundraising, if they were offering a fundraising campaign and or gift cards, the status of their retail location, their address, their website, their social media handles, and then their email. This doesn't appear. This helps us just geocode so that we can identify them on the map. And okay. then we we visualize the information. So this is this is the landing page. Um, these are summary statistics at the top, and you can use these features here to search the map and better understand which businesses are available. So, for example, let's say you are a resident and you want to do delivery mm -hmm. or takeout. You're you're okay with either one, um, and from a business that offers online sales. So you're gonna see these are all green, which means that they're open. That's why they're doing one of these three categories. And these are your options. Now let's say, for example, you live in Harvard Square. That's the area where I live. Mm -hmm. So you you can zoom in further into the map and, and you can also experiment with any of the businesses that are here. So this is Grendel's Den. It's one of my favorites. I've been going since 2008. Um, Grendel's Den's a, a, a second generation owned business, um, carries the owner, and I think her parents founded Grendel's Den. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can identify uh, all this information. I can go to their website, their Facebook page, their Instagram, I can call them and I can place an order. So it's, so it's an incredibly, you know, it's searchable. Well, okay, so wait, go back, go back down. Okay. Yeah. Side point, side point. Go back, go back to retail location status. Yep. So 
this is pretty impressive because this is actually demonstrating to people just how much really is open, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is, which is, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see that, um, you know, uh, shopping, the majority of shopping is remotely open. Um, the, um, the restaurants are quite open. Drink, yeah. The majority of food and drink is open. The majority of restaurants are now open. Mm -hmm. Um, so did you have a database? So, so the process of getting the database yeah. onto the software is mm -hmm. the, uh, is open soft data is open yep. data soft. Yeah. That's a lot of names that I know. Each open other. data soft. Right. So, so that's part platform. of the interface that they've built, mm -hmm. but you had to go to that, that massive um, spreadsheet that you just showed. Yes. And you had to have all this information on 500 and how many businesses? 548. So you already had a directory system. So That's did that right. give you Okay. So did that yeah. give you a leg up on this? Yeah, so we are, it did absolutely. We actually drew from three different sources. So that's that's part of the privilege that we have in Cambridge is that there are a lot of organizations that are active and and from which we can pull information. So the first is that we already have a member directory. So uh -huh. this initiative, we're including every open local business, 548. We only have maybe 496 members. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's bigger than just our membership. So we already have a spreadsheet that, so this is the backend system, it's called Membership Works for mm -hmm. our member directory. So it normally, if you go to our website and you click member directory, this pulls up. And this is something that we launched a year ago and it helps people better understand and interact with the members that we have. And you can search by category and by neighborhood. So again, let's look at a different neighborhood. Let's say I wanted to check out Huron Village, which is a little bit further north of where I am, but walkable because I'm here and it's just a 10 minute walk. So if, right. if I want, yeah, I wanted to look at Huron Village I could see all of our members. So like Erica from Living Harmony, uh, she's wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I could send them a message. I could check out their socials. So this is one source. Also, um, we pulled from the city's website, hmm. um, which is here. And we, we gave, so let's see, what's open? View business list. So they have a smart sheet of all okay. open businesses, all businesses in Cambridge. It has some information. So we started, we, we cross-checked the two spreadsheets. We had to okay. take out, because this is not just local businesses, you see 7-Eleven is here. Um, th these are some larger businesses too. So we removed those and we cross-checked the information. Um, and then we had about five volunteers help populate the rest of it because we added some new features like, the you know, fundraising campaigns and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. Where did these uh, volunteers come from? Oh, so uh, they came from a few, a few sources. The COVID BizLink is um, run by Daniel Wang and a few other high school students in the area. It's a volunteer clearinghouse for, for people in the area who want to support businesses. So cool. yeah, so businesses sign up and you can see we signed up too. Um, so the Williams Agency by Nicola Williams, here's Grendel's Den, um, Charitable Confections, Teddy Shoes, a number of businesses have signed up. And also you can reach out directly to volunteers. You know, I've been wanting somebody, and I, you know, I just, I don't have the chops to develop this. I know Daniel um, will, will, we got a couple, a few minutes left. Yeah. Um, I do want to touch briefly on the, um, internship piece that, that oh we're yeah be doing of course Daniel. but I, I i think that's also something that we can talk about later in the summer when we have a little <laughs> more lessons learned but um yeah this is incredible and this is something that i've been like complaining and complaining that we need to do <laughs> is to have a way to connect people who want to help yeah. even if they you know can't leave their house so much yeah. to yeah businesses, organizations, et cetera, who want to use them. Yeah, so, no, and, and what we've done is is identified those which are local. 
excuse me, local. So, you know, the city has a resource and it's a very good resource. Uh, it just doesn't distinguish between local and non-local businesses. Right. And the message that we're trying to get across is that it's especially important to support local and in independently owned businesses. And Absolutely. so we have, and I think you alluded to this in your um, description for today's event, there are a lot of spreadsheets and spreadsheets can be helpful, um, but a visualization, they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. A visualization is really helpful in, in, better understanding the information it, it presents it in a different fashion and yeah. and i think can be for many people is easier to digest absolutely absolutely there are there are a certain number of people in the world who get all happy when they see a spreadsheet i know i know and that's not the majority of the history right. yeah so that's absolutely fantastic so i want to ask you uh two questions and if anybody who's online has questions that they want to ask. Um, I we launched right in, and I should have said to begin with that you know please post any questions you have in the mm -hmm. chat. Um, so if you've got questions, please 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 do go ahead and post those. Um, I have two questions in the meantime, and actually I'm just going to ask the first one and see if anybody else has anything. And that question is that if you could go back and do anything different over yeah. the last two or three months, mm -hmm. knowing what you know now. And not assuming that you've got a zillion more people or, you know, yeah, $40 million sitting in your bank or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but if you could go back and do anything differently, what would you do? Um, hmm. There's nothing that comes to mind. Um, okay. I think. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Um. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, th I think that we did the best that we could with the resources that we had. Um, and I think we took advantage of every opportunity that came our way. Um, I think that we we really just jumped in. And I I mean, it would be nice to know what I know now, right? To, to know how long things were going to, to, to um, for how long we would be living in this situation so that I could help, could have helped provide some kind of time horizon. I think people were really looking for an expectation of timeline and I was not able to provide that at the onset. So I, yeah. I would have loved to have given them a better sense of, of timeline, but I, I couldn't have known that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we would have all loved a, you know, hard and fast stop date. I think that would have been. We would. Yeah. Lot of people plan. Yeah. And, and we didn't get that this time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not in the universe. Um, so what's next for um, for Cambridge Local First? Well, I'll, I'll show one thing, which is the internship. Um, just very briefly, I think it's a really exciting initiative that we're launching. So truth in advertising, I'm involved with this too. So that's right. Um, OK, so here we go. So I think this is actually a really exciting initiative. Um, so it's called the Resilient Local Economy Summer Internship. We have had about 17 people apply, and I think we're taking 11. Um, I think we'll have an internship class of 11. So what it is, is a, um, a group of four organizations. So Cambridge Local First at the local level, uh, the Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts at the statewide level, and then two national organizations, AMEBA, the American Independent Business Alliance, which Della works with, and the American Sustainable Business Council, another national organization, have come together. And we have 11 interns who will be assisting all four organizations over a 10-week period um, with different, different um, various pieces of work that we're undertaking. And then on Friday, and I think this is the most exciting part of it, on Fridays, we will be uh, helping the interns as they undertake a collective project, which is changing the public narrative on local consumption. So encouraging people around the country to uh, consume locally, yeah. directly. So, so that's something that's on the horizon. We're also cultivating partnerships with new stakeholders and individuals and groups. And, and um, it's hard to expect what's gonna come next. I'm sure things will unfold as they do, but um, the future is a little bit of a mystery. Yeah, it's, uh, we're, if we weren't aware of that before, we're really aware of that now. That's but, right. uh, yeah, and, and one of the things that I really love about this cohort 
is that yeah. it's such a diverse group. So it's people who are from multiple countries, mm -hmm. who are from multiple schools, and anybody who's who's familiar with the stuff that I've done with Econogy, which is another company I'm in that I didn't even mention at the beginning. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, it's an incredible diversity of folks. Some folks are I'm making hand gestures that you can't see. Um, some folks are very much in kind of the world of data analytics. Mm -hmm. Some people are very much in public policy. Some are, you know, business majors, business and marketing yeah. majors. So the opportunity to sort of combine these perspectives and to combine you know, the personal expect, uh, perspectives. We're also dealing with people who range in age from, I mean, Daniel's like, what, 18? Maybe Something 17. Like yeah, oh, he's, a, he's a high school student. He's a rising senior. All right. So, yeah, maybe a senior, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we're ranging from 17 to the oldest um, MBA. I, we, we He's probably roughly 30-ish. Yeah. Um, you know, ex-military guy. I mean, you know. It's, it's, it's an incredible array. And just like Theo laid out with the, um, with, with the Zoom call, something as basic as Zoom calls, you know, establishing that structure, establishing that process, those ground rules at the beginning, you know, makes the world of difference in how people interact with those. Um, that's going to be so much the case with this, with this crew but there's also this incredible ability to just do a lot of stuff that these organizations couldn't do. We should also mention that they're they're all being so so our organizations aren't paying for them because none of us were planning on having interns this summer um, from a financial standpoint. But they're getting support from their universities. Um, they're getting support. Some of them are getting support from companies that they would otherwise have been working for or that they expect to work for in the future. Um, so so these are not, you know, we're not we're not taking advantage of that. But other organizations are kind of stepping up and seeing the potential and the value both to organizations like ours and to the students to you know, again, really, really make the best of the opportunity and get something really good out of it. Yeah. Were you going to add something? Just that I'm really excited for the summer. I think I think it's a really dynamic cohort, just like you've said, with a, a wide range of experiences, ages, backgrounds uh, represented. And I'm excited to see what, what our students do. Right. So if you follow any of these organizations, Cambridge Local First, and you can Google these and find them very easily. Cambridge Local First, Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I have to say that slow or I'll screw it up. Um, the American Independent Business Alliance, AMEBA, or the American Sustainable Business Council, ASBC. Did I say all those right? That's right. Perfect. All right, awesome. Sometimes, sometimes I start getting the names, the names turn into a garble. Um, we'll, we'll be sharing, you know, some of the results of what they're doing. And I have a sneaking suspicion that if you follow Cambridge Local First on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc., you're going to see some really, really good content. Theo's really been the this has been her brainchild. You know, I tied it back to other things that I've been involved with, but this was all her. And I, I kind of walked in and went, oh, my Lord, you're doing what? We're doing what? Thanks. Oh, my God, this is cool. So, so yeah, so I think it'll be great. Theo, you got any parting words for folks? Just to, to support their local businesses. Um, they are the lifeblood of our economies. Um, you know, small business, small and medium sized businesses are 99.9% .9 of all of our businesses and employ one in two Ameri working Americans. So um, as we think about economic recovery in the days ahead, uh, they are an important set of stakeholders. And so support your, your business owners, um, say hi to them and, and be kind to them because they're, they're quite overwhelmed right now. Um, but we want to make sure that they're positioned for success. So. Uh, thank you for listening in and um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions too. I'm happy to hear yeah. from you. Theo, can you verbally give a um, address that oh, yeah. you can reach out sure. to you? So it's Theodora at CambridgeLocalFirst.org. So that's T-H-E-O-D-O-R-A at CambridgeLocalFirst.org.
Awesome. Awesome. And I'll post links to all of this material when um, this is uploaded. So if you want to share this video, I'm backed up on video and audio editing right now um, for mostly personal reasons, trying to get my son to finish high school um, at the oh. same time as his, his computer died in the last like two, three weeks of high school. I'm so, so sorry. Oh my yeah. God. I mean, of all the things to happen, that's like, you know, it's a bit. Yeah. But, but it's the final push. Well, what it, what it means is that the time that I would have used for video editing, I've had to give my computer over to him so he can write papers and attempt to do the stuff that he doesn't want to do anymore. Um, so I will get this video up within okay. the next, hopefully within the next week or so. Um, if you go to wiseeconomy.com and you go to the blog, there will be an article on this and it'll include links to the video upload, to the content um, that we've talked about today, all the links and, and all of that kind of thing, as well as links to audio via Stitcher. You, uh, you can pick it up as, as a podcast from Stitcher and Spotify um, or listen to it one off via SoundCloud. So all those links will be there. So thank you again so much, Theo. It is okay. light. I am, it's just been one of my, one of the high points of the last month for me to just get to know you and, and Same here. the opportunity to work with you. So, and I know you and I will be talking in like really, really, really soon. I know we will. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a blast. To speak the truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert
speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes...